Craig Stark, CJF, winging on Oklahoma. You know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason that the event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Farrier Podcast. I had a soccer coach, and he always said, we are going to be the fittest team always out there. Because in the moment, you don't want to be worried about being tired. You want to be focused on the soccer game. Right. Which is what's going to translate for me, hopefully, in the CJF, is that I'm not worried about being tired. I can focus on the task at hand. And granted, yeah, he was like, get your specimens made. You know, three months before you take your exam, get all your AW specimens made. And it's good to have other people putting that pressure on you as well. Sometimes if it's a single journey, you know, and you've not got mentors that are coaching you, helping you, and you kind of rest, rest a little bit. If you're hearing this, you are currently on the non-subscriber feed. If you would like to hear this episode in its entirety, please subscribe using the link below. If you're a student, apprentice, or just find yourself in a situation where it isn't financially feasible to subscribe, please reach out to me on Facebook or through the website. The good folks at Out West Design and Fabrication are lending their support by helping us to cover your scholarship subscription. You can check out many of their incredible projects on their Facebook page. Out West Design and Fabrication, your choice for farrier rakes. Now here's a sample of this week's episode. Thank you for listening. Most people that I know in this industry only want the best for the other people in the industry, which is a pretty cool thing. Welcome everyone. A little shopkeeping before we start. The BFBAs, Focus, and the Stonely International are coming up at the end of this month. If you haven't already heard my most recent episode on the 2022 Focus and International, give that one a listen and it'll give you a pretty good idea as to what you can expect over there. Both are truly world-class events and definitely worth attending. This will be my third year in a row heading out there, and I find myself just as excited now as I was on the first trip. Go to forgeandfarrier.co.uk for more details. I hope to see you there. And just a reminder that my friend Brandon Paulson, with his passion project Shod with Love, will be hosting an upcoming event. Shod with Love is a foundation dedicated to assisting individuals pursuing an education in hoof care. They aim to generate funding through events and donations to provide financial aid for farrier schools and certifications. Shod with Love's first event will be a clinic and contest this October 11th and 12th with the legendary Mike Poe. Enjoy the crisp fall weather and beautiful foliage in the upper valley of New Hampshire while learning and competing amongst your peers. Visit shodwithlove.com for more details. Now, I should say that I first met Brandon Paulson in the heartland during his journey to achieve his certified farrier certification with the AFA. Brandon is just one of the many cool people that I have met through doing that journey myself. And that certification process exists due to the mostly unrecognized efforts and sacrifices of many folks like the gentleman you're about to hear. Craig Stark is the chairman of the certification committee of the AFA. And I got to spend some quality time with Craig and his wife, Emily, down in Mexico during Vern Powell's Puerto Vallarta clinic. We bonded pretty quickly over conversations about mountain biking, and certification. I had a great time getting to know them both. As the clinic was drawing to a close, Craig and I found a somewhat quiet corner and had this chat. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. You have a pretty uh, important position at the AFA. Uh, certification chairman, yeah. And how did you get into that? I got asked to do it. Oh, see now I've been doing it for about I think this is seven years, and... I knew it had been a while. Yeah, it's been a while, and I was actually asked to do it the year before that, and then through some various circumstances, it just it didn't happen, then got asked again about a year later. <laughs> my knee-jerk reaction was no. In fact, my wife's knee-jerk reaction was no. Uh, I was still president of the Oklahoma Affairs Association, and had been for 
well over 10 years. Ended up being oh, almost 15 wow. in total. Oh, wow. And that was just a lot of irons in the fire. Yeah, no you know, kidding. Also raising three kids and, and having a wife and, and actually trying to have time for myself in there somewhere too. So Right. All of those things, that I'm sure it's a ton of phone calls and meetings and, and all of that stuff. How did you make that all work? Kind of the same thing with, with everything. Did a lot of scheduling, uh, just dedicate time. I'm kind of an OCD guy with uh, systems and schedules and, you know, just like date nights for when uh, kids were little. I would write it in my book. Oh, really? You know, I made sure that at least once a month, me and Emily had a date night. Uh, so it's kind of the same type of thing. Right. That's the way my little brain works. If I don't lay out a system, I can sway from it. But if I don't lay it out initially, then... Things fall apart? Yeah, nothing happens. Yeah, I know myself too well. So I had to do a lot, a lot of that. So yeah, I had to lay out so much time during the week for, you know, running Oklahoma stuff, OFA, and then... Figuring out the certification, the chairman job was, in the beginning, I was winging it. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just trying to come in as a, uh, I was the first chairman that wasn't an examiner when I got asked to do this. Oh, really? Okay. But I came in as an unbiased. I wasn't on either side, not that there was really sides, but I just came in. I ran all the meetings by policy, and it was just per the letter of the law. Policy sometimes hamstrings kind of like rules. They can hamstring a lot of things in life, but yet it also gives you something to lean back on. So it was good to give us some structure to get there. You know, I'm still kind of at heart. A a handshake ought to be good enough, but yet I know deep (laughs) down that's not always how life works out. Right. Yeah. Not everybody holds to that. Yeah. Unfortunately not. Through that process and kind of figuring out the job and what my job really is, it's gotten better and better at it. And as with anything in life, if there's one or more humans involved, it's never going to be perfect. Yeah. Right. Less than one, you stand a chance. But one <laughs> or more. One, yeah. yeah. One or more, nothing's going to be perfect. But it is a system. You know, in the beginning, when I saw the first CJF Farrier, I thought, I want to have the skill level he did. And so how do I get there? Well, luckily, the first guy I ever worked with out of shoeing school was one of the original founders of the Oklahoma Farriers Association and a journeyman. And so I asked him, I was like, how do I get there? He's like, Start with certification. And he said, and if you really want to get good and be proficient at certification, you start going to contest. You get used to working under pressure, under time, people looking at you, having your stuff scored. And he's like, and if you go to a contest and don't do so well, it doesn't feel like as big a deal than if you go to a certification and get told you suck. So you started competing? Yeah, started competing pretty much immediately. Realized how little I knew. I sadly went to my first certification. I did pass the written. The one thing I got out of, you know, all my years in college was that I, I knew how to study. I knew how I learned. I think that's something we don't focus on in, in life. We're not taught is how, how you learn. I learned how I learned so I could, I could study. So the written testing, fairly easy for me. Uh, my shoe display found its way to the dirt in about 0.2 seconds. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> my trim got stopped about three seconds in, so I made it a little farther. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, I had no idea. And sadly, I had gone to a local Western wear store that had a monogrammer and I had hats made that said Craig Stark certified farrier <laughs> ahead of time because I was that naive. And, <laughs> and sadly, I never went and picked them up. I was so embarrassed. Really? Yeah, I never did. <laughs> They're probably still sitting there. <laughs> you know? Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. 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 So it was one of those. I was, it was a good piece of humble pie right there. Yeah. I hear that story from a lot of people where they came into it expecting it to be something else, I think, a cakewalk, yeah. basically. And you think, like, hey, I shoe horses every day. I get paid for it. I know my stuff. Yeah. And then you show up and... Yeah, we all know and we're afraid that, you know, we're the, the masters of our universe. Our clients think we're the best thing that's ever happened. You know, I'm the best that I've ever seen type of mentality. And then all of a sudden you get that humility. Yeah. And you're, oh man, how do I make a living doing this? But (laughs) once you break through that and realize that all of us have been there, all of us are in the process of learning until the day we hang it up, we're trying to get better. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. And yeah, in theory, if you can break past that and be around this amazing group that we have, then you can learn the sky's the limit. Yeah. You can learn so much, infinite amount of knowledge. And I think that's what really sucked me into the farrier industry was that there is no top. There's no plateaus. Unless you make, if you want to trim broodmares in the mud for 10 bucks, you can do it. If you want to shoe world-class Olympic horses for however much, 500, 750 a piece, whatever it is, you can do that. Yeah. 
And it's, there's only one person who'll stop you. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I also think it speaks a lot to a person's character because that story is pretty common of somebody going into the exam, expecting one thing, getting that humble pie. And I've known some who've said, this whole process sucks. The AFA doesn't know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. I'm a great chewer. And they never attempt it again. But for somebody to come back and even come back multiple times. Absolutely. And do that. What happened after that? How did you regroup and figure it out? Well, luckily, it was right when Dusty Franklin had moved down from Kansas City uh, to Oklahoma. Uh, and I met him almost immediately. And luckily, he somehow or another saw through the facade and saw something in there that <laughs> was worth trying to help or something. And he's just, obviously, his testimony is huge far and wide. But this was when he was uh, just became an examiner. You know, initially, he's like, why don't you come help me? And I kind of blew him off, not intentionally blowing him off. I just didn't really understand what he was saying. Well, then he had a pre-cert clinic at a local supply place, and I was too hard-headed to say no. I was going to get this certification that, that this gentleman, Gary Gloden, was the guy that originally got me headed this direction. And with a lot of the guys in the area of Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, he's, he's well-known. Dusty's like, no. And we had horses there, that pre-cert clinic, a couple days, hands-on, the whole shebang. And he's like, no, I mean it. Why don't you come? Ride with me two days a week. I'll pay you for your help, but we'll work on certification stuff while we're shoeing horses together. Okay. So like when I first got there, we just started with, you know, kind of the top of the trim list. You know, everything's based on your frog as far as finding your foot. So give me, we'll work towards tens on your frog. When you kind of get dialed in on that, you still have to have good frogs. Then we start working on the sole. And once you get that kind of dialed in, then we start working on So he let me step my way up into where... I could do some trimming and he would score that and it's too fit. And mm -hmm. you know, the whole time I'm still having to make good frogs, good soles, do good clinching, good finish work until I put all the pieces of the puzzle together and, and then still managed to fail the test five more times, but <laughs> you still kept coming yeah. back though. Yeah. Never claimed to be smart. Just <laughs> stubborn. <laughs> stubborn. So, yeah. I, uh, of the same ilk, like yeah. I don't pick things up quickly, but I get kind of honed in on it after I get a taste of it. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's uh, exactly what I did. I learned so many good lessons. I remember one time, one of the lessons was soul pressure. And they came over there with my mulligan and said, uh, check your soul pressure. I said, yeah, got it. Like, you mean you have it or you cleared it up? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah, locked in. I got it all the way across. They're like, no, you relieve it. Oh, okay. That's what I meant. Yes, I did that. I did. So I got stopped immediately on that one, too. So, uh, yeah. Drew blood, too long, too short, sprung heel. I mean, I, yeah, if there was a way to fail it, I've, I've tried it at least once. But, man, yeah, those lessons stick with you, right? I know it. Yeah. Why are those ones that sting so bad the ones that yeah. <laughs> stick with you yeah. so well? Yeah. Yeah, the painful ones. And still, so from there, you still went on for your, your CJF? Yep. By this point, I had all three kids. Built a house in the middle of all this, so I'd chew horses oh, wow. every day and then come home and build on a house. Me and my wife did 90% of the work, took 13 months, and wow, you know, I don't know that I'd have built a matchbook house after that one was done, but we got, <laughs> we got her licked, and it's a beautiful home, raised three beautiful kids in, and then worked on my journeyman at the same time, and I passed my journeyman in 2006-ish. Okay. And then kind of back then... Being a tester was one of those things. It was just kind of, that's just what you did. You know, once you passed your journeyman, then you immediately just. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, started working on being a tester if you wanted to give back. And, you know, I do think that, and it's gotten way better, but there's been a lot of people that felt like being a, an approved tester was the, the next step of being a better farrier. Well, it's not. It's a, a level of servitude, as is the examiners. You're working hard. You're paying out money of your own pocket to go make sure the next generation has the, the opportunities you did. And in fact, backtracking to when I decided to, actually, my wife kind of talked to him. This is when my son, Garrett, who a lot of people know, uh, started shoeing. And she said, not that saying you will or won't have this effect on the industry, or at least on the AFA certification, but if you don't try and something happened and it failed and Garrett or all the other little Garretts out there didn't have the same opportunity you did, how would you feel? Right. Stupid logic. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, that's a valid point. So let's see if I can be a cog in the wheel and try to keep this thing as good and trying to produce better products, better farriers for the horse. You know, again, this is all about the horse. 
and uh, trying to do the best job we can. But we have right now, it has been amazing. Our, our meetings are so, we get so much done in a short period of time. We have a great group of examiners. It's easy to run these meetings and keep the examiners kind of all headed in the same direction. And we have so much passion, which I think anytime we have this big a volunteer group, we got to have that much passion because there's a lot of other things in life we could all be doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. It could all fall apart otherwise. Yeah, exactly. How many examiners are there? To date, we have 17. Oh, wow. Still okay. have a couple provisionals out there. We're getting to a pretty full book, but we try to look at where regionally, you know, make sure each region's well covered. We're kind of heavy in the central region two area, uh, but we've had a couple people move around, change locations, uh, a couple others are fixing to. So that'll actually kind of spread it out, which is awesome. Okay. We've got a, a new examiner in uh, Canada and starting another one pretty quick. So we had two for a while and both of them retired, just had done it for so long. And Gerard and Steven, and they were great guys, super good examiners. Just they paid their dues and ready to yeah, ready to do something else. Yeah, ready to yeah, live life, which is yeah, awesome. Don't blame them. It's been amazing. It really has. As long as they keep wanting me to do it, I'll I'll do it for a while longer because I think I'm figuring the system out and figuring out the direction we want to go. Because it's not about any one of us. It's not about Craig's opinion. It's not about Dusty's opinion. As valid as. And vital as he is to certification and has been, he's, uh, he's a figurehead for us, as everybody knows. But it's not about any one of us. It's about the whole thing. Right. It's amazing. Another really neat aspect to it is your pre-cert and the yes. crew that you have doing that. Because I haven't attended one myself other than the one in the Heartland. But just the guys that have come to Ontario to do them, every time I speak to whoever's attended, they always have learned so much in like two days. Yeah. Yeah. The certification instructors are, and about half of them are examiners. Of course, they have to be at least a tester. Right. Yeah. To be considered to be a certification instructor. And it is a program. You know, we were realizing that we were asking for a product, but we weren't telling people how to get there hmm. unless you sat down with a tester examiner. So it took a while to kind of iron that out. And we're still, as like I said, with anything, there's one or more people involved. It's never going to be perfect, but it's a great system. They, they really get in that thing fine tuned, just kind of, getting the advertising out there so people are aware yeah that it's an option and what to expect from it but those guys are super handy and they're actually kind of run through the ringer to make sure they are good teachers yeah so you could be a great tester you could be a great farrier you can be a great examiner but you might not necessarily be the best at explaining things mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean you're a bad person just yeah we all have our talents you know it's you know what's better a car or a truck well it depends on what you're trying to do mm -hmm. yeah Right. It's just a whole different thing. But yeah, the certification instructors and the pre-certification program, and, and we work hand in hand. We all communicate really well with each other to make sure that they're teaching what we're asking. And I say us and them, but yet it's still the same deal. There were some changes that you had made. We were discussing this the other night that as a group, you changed it where the testers and examiners have to always update, right? Yep. How recent of a thing is that? It actually uh, started the year before I did. Okay. If I count back seven years, 2016, 2015-ish. They've always had quote-unquote updates per policy. You didn't have to produce a particular item. You just showed up. Usually, we just kind of visited, ran through some scores, ran through the paperwork, just kind of kept your mind at ease. But now, to be considered an updated test or examiner, it's the same process. You have to shoe two feet, one per certified passing certified level, one per passing journeyman level in time. You have to produce a new CF shoe board every couple years. You pass a written test by 80% over the certification guide. So you have to know what the guide says. Oh, okay. And that's the biggest thing is we, we want all our representatives to carry a cert guide with them, but you also need to be able to regurgitate information pretty quick. You know, when you're trying to score feet, it's great to have the guide there for reference, but if you know your score sheet, you should be able to throw out some, some numbers, the numbers that reflect what the candidate did. You know, it's a little pet peeve of mine is when I say, well, I, you know, I got him on uh, expansion. No, the candidate produced so much expansion, you know, the guidebook. So you scored them appropriately. Right. You didn't do the work. You just are our representative reflecting what scores were thrown at you. Mm -hmm. In some ways, you're not in an enviable position because... <laughs> As in any human activity, when you tell somebody that they weren't good enough. It's hard. Yeah. And you become the figurehead that 
that ire goes to in some cases, I imagine. What is that like? How do you resolve that situation? In my tenure so far, I've had some official complaints. Okay. The one thing I did is cleaned up a lot of policy, made a lot of policy, and one of which is how we deal with testers or examiners in a disciplinary action. Okay. There was zero policy about that before. Really? We worked on that, wrote a lot of stuff down, got things in there, and there's you know, a systematic way to deal with disciplinary actions. For starters... If you would like to hear this episode in its entirety, please subscribe using the link in the show notes. Thank you for listening.